Thank you. So now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Mike Gailey. Um, he is the uh, Northeast Regional Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator. He works for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and his office is um, near Buffalo. He's at the uh, Lower Great Lakes Fisheries Resources Office, and he has been with um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a little over six years, and he has um, worked very hard to promote the uh, principles of prevention planning in um, this, this hazard analysis and um, critical control point planning. He does a couple workshops, a few workshops a year, and I'm looking forward to Mike's um, mini course in HACCP. So, Mike, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Leslie. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I assume that's a yes. Yes. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, thank Leslie for uh, inviting me to talk about HACCP. Um, it's not really a new concept, but I think it is fairly new to uh, the work that we all do. And as Le Leslie mentioned, I've been with the service for about six years now. Um, and in that time, we've worked with partners from New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Lake Champlain, and also Virginia Sea Grant to help implement these workshops and promote the, the HACCP training. Um, in that time since I've been here, we've, done a, we've conducted about 10 workshops in the Northeast uh, from Maine all the way down to Virginia. And we've trained over 200 people uh, from state and federal agencies, um, academic institutions, and even some private consultants as well. So it's really been a productive uh, process so far. We, we've had a pretty diverse audience. Um, within the Fish and Wildlife Service, right now we currently have approximately 16 HACCP plans being implemented across our uh, fishery stations, our, our fishery resource offices, uh, our hatcheries, fish health centers, and we're trying to continue to boost that number up um, to get everybody on board. And actually, the Fish and Wildlife Service, within probably a matter of weeks, I, I don't know exactly when it's going to come down, but there is a national policy that's going to apply to every fishery office and hatchery uh, nationwide within the Fish and Wildlife Service um, that they will have to have a HACCP plan in place. So we're excited about that. and. Uh, anxious to you know continue to move that forward I, I also just want to take a second just to thank a few people there's a bunch of people that I could thank and I, I would never get through them all right now but um, I wanted to thank Leslie and also the the New York DEC for assisting with um, a workshop we had last year about a year ago in Rochester um, that was very productive we also had the AFS the American Fisheries Society the New York chapter assist with that um, I've also had a lot of help from uh, some other agencies, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, um, the Lake Champlain Basin Program, and Meg Moldley in particular was, has been very helpful uh, with our HACCP work, and also Dr. Ed Mills from Cornell um, assisted with a, a workshop that we had uh, at Shackleton Point a couple, several years ago. Um, I especially want to thank Helen Domsky with New York Sea Grant because she's been my partner in teaching these workshops and she's been very instrumental in it, and we certainly couldn't be where we are without Helen's help. So um, I just want to thank her. The one thing I know I certainly don't have to do today is explain to this group the, the problems that we all face with invasive species, but I just left this slide in there because this is one that we typically show early on in the HACCP training um, as a, just to give a, to, to incorporate the, the breadth of, of how big a problem we have both within the aquatics and the terrestrial uh, realm with invasives. So we certainly have the issues out there and, and we know what we need to do. Um, there's a couple of options obviously for dealing with invasive species. Uh, number one, we can accept them and I don't think anyone on this call really wants to do that, but unfortunately in some cases it's the only option that we, we have uh, realistically if we're thinking of something that's out in the open waters of the Great Lakes that, you know, is not isolated enough to control. Um, and we don't have that magic vacuum yet that we can take out and uh, just suck up the fish that we don't want or the, the invertebrates that we don't want in the lake. So that being said, uh, something like control and eradication or prevention are really going to be the only options that remain for us. Um, control and eradication are certainly ideal, but as we know, they're not always economically or logistically feasible to do. Um, so that 
tends to leave prevention as really one of our most effective courses of action. And that's where HACCP comes in. I'll just give you a little background about HACCP. Uh, the history of HACCP it was originally pioneered by the Pillsbury Company for the U.S. space program back in the 1960s. And um, it's essentially a way to ensure that whatever product you're producing, in this case food, uh, was free of non-target pathogens, things that you didn't want in the food. Um, and it kept that product pure. Uh, so it was very useful in that sense. But Sea Grant, a number of years ago, uh, modified the, the process a little bit to target aquaculture facilities, hatcheries, um, things of that nature. And it you know, really works the same way. It's using the same principles, the same steps that are involved, and uh, trying to be proactive in it. So, and, and that's a key point, that HACCP is proactive as opposed to being reactive. Um, and as we know, with invasive species, that can very often mean savings, either economically, um, ecosystem-wise, you know, time and energy. If we can stop something before it becomes a problem, that it's certainly better down the road. But unfortunately, we also know that can be tough to sell sometimes, um, trying to, you know, trying to sell the idea of spending a thousand dollars now so that you don't have to spend a million dollars down the road uh, sometimes can be difficult. But HACCP is, is one proactive approach that makes it a little easier to try to do that. The other uh, old saying that I'll quote here is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And it's really applicable with the HACCP process because you end up with a document that weighs a couple of ounces, but what you could be preventing in this case, this picture here is uh, uh, a net full of Asian carp, is, you know, beyond words. I mean, it's fantastic if we could prevent something that like that with just a simple HACCP plan. Um, the one thing I will mention, though, is that HACCP won't guarantee that you're not going to get invasive species introduced, but it does show a couple of things. Number one, it shows responsibility on the part of the agency or the academic institution or whoever is instituting the plan. It shows accountability. Um, and it shows a positive effort. And that's something that allows us to be role models for the people that we talk to every day. We talk to recreational boaters and fishermen, and we, we encourage them to clean their boats and clean their gear. But if we're not doing that ourselves, then it, it's, it doesn't mean as much. So HACCP really allows us to be able to do that. There's uh, five main steps in the HACCP process, and I'm going to go through each one. The, the problem with doing it on a PowerPoint is that each step has an associated worksheet that goes with it, and the worksheets have pretty small text in them. So I'm going to try to do it a little differently this time and just give a, a rough description of each of the steps. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll show you those worksheets, um, just kind of a, an overview of them. Typically, our training is a, a one-day course. Um, and, and so this gives you a lot of time to really get into the forms and, and look at them in detail. And we also try to incorporate a field trip in that. But, you know, within the, the confines of, of this conference call, I'll, I'll just kind of go through the steps uh, fairly quickly. The first step is the activity description. And it is really, it, it's very straightforward. And it, it's almost as simple as just saying who, what, where, when, why, and how of the process. Um, a good activity description shouldn't be too long. It, sh it should, you know, be about eight or nine sentences maybe, um, just a paragraph, just describing who's doing it, why they're doing it, um, et cetera. And just based on these pictures, I just want to remind you that it can be applied for both terrestrial and aquatic uses. It's not limited to aquatics, even though that's what uh, I happen to specialize in and that's where the fisheries program uh, within the Fish and Wildlife Service uses it the most, but it, it can cover both aquatic and terrestrial. Step two in the process is, again, another worksheet that you work through, and it, it's just a way of identifying what potential hazards um, you might encounter. And obviously the hazards that we're referring to are animals and plants. Um, the way the HACCP plan divides it up is vertebrates and invertebrates, uh, plant hazards, and then something called other biologics, which would include things like um, different genetic types, uh, maybe diseases or pathogens, things that don't really fit in the first three categories. 
can be included there. Uh, and we know with VHS and, and IPN and some of the other disease issues that our hatcheries and, and um, waters are facing, that it's important to have this category. There's also an others category, and that can include basically everything else that doesn't fit in the other four groups. Um, it could be some kind of chemical. Maybe you're using a chemical in your work and you don't want that chemical, maybe some kind of pesticide, um, and you want to be sure that that pesticide doesn't get into a certain habitat, you might want to write a HACCP plan to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, so it just sort of covers everything else that, that might not otherwise be covered in the other categories. Step three is then going to be the flow diagram. And the other important thing I want to point out with each of these worksheets is that they, they tend to build upon each other. And you may see a little bit of that here in the presentation, but when you're really sitting down doing the plan, it'll make a lot more sense. Um, we've identified the activity. We've listed the hazards. Now what we want to do is just list a step-by-step -step chronology of what takes place during your process. And in this case, if you, you know, we, we want to keep it very simple. We don't want to get too elaborate. Um, typically, the flow diagrams that I've seen range from anywhere from six to ten steps. Um, so in this case, if you look at this slide, starting with the picture on the top, in, in our plan, um, our first step is to go to the boat storage facility, pick up the boat and the gear, and hook up the trailer. Um, our next step is to travel to the location. Um, the step after that is to launch the boat, travel to the, the specific sampling site. Uh, the step after that is to collect fish or invertebrates, look through the catch, uh, and then the last step is to travel home and uh, go back to the boat storage facility. So it's a very straightforward, very simple language that you use in the plan, but the HACCP process is designed to um, be very structured and to force you to analyze each and every step. Step four in the HACCP process is going to be the hazard analysis worksheet. And again, what we're doing, we're going, what we just did in step three, we're taking each of those steps and we're going through each of them and assessing them for different hazards. So we're looking at each step and we're basically trying to identify the, both the severity and the significance of any potential hazards that might be introduced at each of those steps. And we're trying to decide if we could use a control measure of some sort, maybe a power washer, maybe a visual inspection, um, maybe some sort of disinfectant that we spray on the gear, or maybe a combination of all three. Whatever that control is, we, we basically list what control options might be viable for these steps. The other thing that we're going to do at step four is we're going to, uh, and this is really one of the, the, the big heart of the HACCP process, is we're trying to identify whether it's a control point or a critical control point. And you can see by the definitions here, a control point obviously is just any step where a potential hazard can be controlled. The critical control point is the one that we're going to really be interested in. That's the best point um, at which a significant hazard can be controlled. And, and the way, one way to kind of keep these square is, is to think about a critical control point as being the last step. That, that's the last chance you have to take some sort of action. So an example of that might be in a hatchery. If you're raising, uh, let's say, largemouth bass to be stocked in a lake, and you know that those bass are, are you keep them in an outdoor raceway for a portion of the year, um, maybe there's some sort of frog or, or invertebrate or something that can get into that raceway that you don't want to introduce somewhere else. Well, if, you, if your critical control point isn't the stage right before those fish go onto a hatchery truck, there's no other time to take take any kind of action. The, the next step is those fish being introduced into the water where they're being stocked. And, and if you don't look at what's going into the hatchery truck, uh, you don't really know what's going to be going out of it then when you stock them. So that would be an example of a critical control point where you would take some sort of action, such as visual inspection or uh, maybe putting them through some sort of uh, a sieve, so to speak, so you can weed out the, the larger or the smaller organisms out of that. This then leads us to the last step in the HACCP process, which is the HACCP plan form. And this is what I like to call the walk-away document. This is what, 
what you do all the work for. This is the, the piece of paper that has all the information that you need. Um, a technician or a volunteer or a biologist in your office can take that and implement the HACCP plan uh, just based on this one piece of paper alone. So at this stage, you've gone through and you've, you've assessed each of your tasks in your process, and you've identified where your critical control points are. And that's the whole point of, of doing this whole HACCP plan. So what you end up with then, um, this is just the step five worksheet. Uh, I'll show you the other ones in a minute, but this is the walkaway document that we have for our office. And I don't know if my mouse is coming up here, but over on the column on the left here, you'll see the critical control points that we've identified. Uh, we have eight steps in our process, and we've identified three of them as being critical points where we want to take some sort of action. Um, for example, the first one, task five, the, we, the next step we do then is to identify what the significant hazards were or are. Um, in this case, fish, plants, invertebrates, um, VHS, other diseases could have been picked up. We're going to identify some sort of um, limit for the control measure. And, and this is a little fuzzy when it comes to natural resource management work. Um, it works a lot better if you're in a hatchery or in a, a laboratory where you, you have strict guidelines. For example, if you know that um, a certain species has, it, it's killed if you have, you know, it'll be killed by a temperature of, say, um, 30 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees Celsius. You, you always want to make sure that your water is, let's say, 31 degrees Celsius. So that's going to be your limit, and you're going to monitor that to make sure that that water never falls below that. Um, for example, in a hatchery, we, oftentimes uh, you'll, you'll see there was an example of a hatchery where there could potentially be milfoil mixed in with the fish that were brought into the hatchery. And what they used was a flow rate, a certain flow rate of water uh, pushed those weeds along the surface so that they could get um, netted out of there. And they wanted to monitor that flow rate to make sure the flow rate didn't fall below whatever that limit was. With the work that we do, it's a little fuzzy there, so we just basically say that we're going to thoroughly examine the catch. Um, as far as monitoring is concerned, we're going to monitor the catch. We're going to do it visually. The frequency, we're going to do it when the fish are collected. And as far as who is responsible, um, about halfway across that, that chart there, it's all crew. Any, anybody on the crew is responsible for, for looking at the catch. Um, so it's, again, pretty difficult to explain in a 30-minute in presentation, but if you take a look at it and really analyze it, you'll see that each of these steps, there's some sort of action and there's some person who's responsible for doing that. And I, I think that's the most important thing really to walk away um, with this. The other thing to notice down at the bottom is there's a place for a signature. And at the end of the day, when we're done with our field work, somebody signs that and the next person using that boat or that gear and look back at the data sheet at the clipboard and can see that the plan was followed. So they know that the gear should be cleaned and that someone followed the plan correctly. I'll just show you real quick here. These are the other sheets. Um, the bottom right is the one I just showed you. That's the step five. But if you start in the upper left, that's where uh, the step one worksheet is. And we go on to the other ones just following the arrows. And those are all the documents that are really used in the HACCP process. Um, you may have a couple of step four worksheets because there's often several, several more steps that uh, you can't fit on one. But um, the bottom line, as I just mentioned, the step five sheet, the last one there, is the one that you really want to walk away with. I'll just take a second just to talk about our office and, and why we have an, a HACCP plan. Um, you see in this map here, the region five is the region that we're typically working within. And the red stars on there indicate fieldwork locations that we've had over the past, I would say, five or six years. Um, and so, and often many times we're using the same gear, the same boats um, in these different locations. So we realize that, you know, it's very important to have a, a plan um, to try to prevent the inadvertent movement of species. Obviously, in the Great Lakes, if you're moving zebra mussels from one part of the lake to the other, it may not be as big of a factor, but 
oftentimes somebody may want to borrow a piece of equipment, and if we don't have that equipment cleaned, then we could be giving it to them, and they could be introducing it somewhere else. So there's a lot of reasons to have a plan, um, even if you know a species is pretty ubiquitous where you're going to be working. But we have a variety of field work activities, um, and I, I just use this slide to kind of reemphasize the fact that it can be used for fish, it can be used for invertebrates, water quality, uh, just about any kind of field work that we're involved in. Even if you're out with a GPS just taking coordinates of something, uh, you might be picking something up on your boots. Or if you're using a boat, you could be still have something on your motor. So uh, it's very, very applicable to a variety of activities. Same thing with our field sorting. Um, one of the other reasons this is a critical control point for us is because one of our other jobs is to monitor and, and perform early detection for invasive species. So we train our crews to be uh, observant in the catch that they pull in. And if they see something that looks out of place, you know, they know to, to question that and to try to figure out what it is and, and reporting. So it's the reporting purposes of it as well um, make the field sorting a very important part of it. So the potential for moving uh, species in the work that we do definitely exists. And we obviously need to have a, a protocol in place um, to try to prevent that. And HACCP has really been a, a good tool for us. Um, it's also important to keep our staff informed of HACCP and, and the changes that might be involved, um, the edits to it. I'll talk more about that in a second. So the, the HACCP plan that we have, you know, some stations will have more than one plan. They might have one for electrofishing, one for uh, gill netting. We did that at first, but we, we realized that we really could, we could get away with just having one plan. And there's no right or wrong answer. It just sort of depends on um, whether you're a lumper or a splitter. If you, if you want to split it up into different plans, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, we, we found that we were able to do it in one plan, and that made it a little, little less, you know, cumbersome for us to have to manage different plans and, and keep multiple people informed about it. Um, we also have a specific issue here where we oftentimes will be traveling for four or five days at a time, and we don't have access to our power washer and uh, a big open parking lot to let a net dry or something like that. So we've had to incorporate some of those travel obstacles, as I call them, uh, into our plan and be able to find a way to still you know, clean our gear when we're in a hotel parking lot or if there's no access to a power washer, which is very frequently the case. Um, so there's also been this evolving process of user friendliness and just trying to figure out how to use the plan and just <laughs> constantly be reminded to use it. The other thing about the HACCP plan that's important is that it provides a written record of our activities. Um, you know, it, it shows that we are making an effort and trying to, trying to prevent the spread, which, as I mentioned before, is very important as being as role models to, the, to um, the recreational users and others in the community. And also for us, it addresses our regional priorities and, and soon to be our national priorities. Um, our regional management plan, we have a um, plan for the regional Fish and Wildlife Service. It's HACCP is specifically identified right in there. And as I mentioned, the national policy is going to be coming down pretty soon. One other thing from uh, the step five, there, there's a uh, a part where you can include supporting documentation on that plan. And just some examples of that could include stocking slips, uh, sign-off sheets of, of various kinds, maybe an importation permit, um, literature review, health certificates. Um, in our case, we have disinfectant guidelines. That it's basically the, the label from, from the VERCON that we use. Uh, we staple all that stuff right onto the HACCP plan so that if someone has a question about how it should be applied or whether it's, uh, you know, what kind of uh, personal protective equipment you need, if anything. Those sorts of things are all things that you can attach to the HACCP plan and keep as document, keep, keep as part of the records. So at this point, uh, the HACCP plan is complete, uh, but I want to emphasize that it's never really final. We, you've completed the plan and you've, you know, at this point identified all the hazards and the ways that you're going to control things. But the fact that there's going to be new invasive species that may pop up on the radar, um, there may be new cleaning tactics that come about, and, and they might be better than the ones you're using. 
And obviously, if you have new employees, uh, they're going to need to be trained. If you're in a situation where you have uh, volunteers or seasonal employees that come in and you, you have a higher turnover rate, it's just as important to keep them involved and, you know, let them take some ownership of the issue um, and be able to implement that plan as well as you can. So that's all important information that you need to keep in mind when you're developing a HACCP plan. This, um, one other thing I want to mention, the Fish and Wildlife Service in Region 2, which is the southwest region that's basically Texas, Arizona, uh, Oklahoma, that area, my counterpart out there, the coordinator for Region 2, developed a HACCP website. And I get a lot of the information from there, but if anyone is interested in following up on this, um, you see the website there. I, I'll have it on the last slide as well. The, uh, it, it's really a fantastic resource, and I'm just going to show you a couple of screenshots here um, of what you'll find when you go to the website. This is the main page, and if you, uh, you look along the top here, there's a, a number of tabs that you can go to. Uh, the first page obviously has just some general information about it. There's a, a page that has example plans that people have submitted, uh, and I'll show you that in a second. There's various uh, documents, um, a page to announce workshops and trainings, and some other contact information. So it's, it's very useful. One other thing is this uh, HACCP planning wizard that was developed a couple of years ago. Um, if you click on that link, there's actually a, a link to a page that where you can download a HACCP wizard. And while I, I strongly encourage everybody to take one of our workshops, um, if you really are, are in a, a hurry to put together a plan and, you, and you're you want to try this wizard, it works pretty well. Um, it starts, it's kind of hard to see here, but it starts with step one. You input all the information you would normally put in a step one worksheet, and then you click next, and it goes on to step two, and then step three, and so on. And in the end, what you end up with is a Microsoft Word document that has all five steps in there, and you're ready to go. You have your HACCP plan all created for you. So it's pretty, uh, pretty useful to use. If you go to the documents page, you'll see a variety of documents. There's uh, some fact sheets that talk about the HACCP process. Uh, there's a couple of things on there that talk uh, recommended guidelines, in this case, uh, for zebra mussels. Uh, so, and this is, you know, they try to update this as much as possible, but there's some good information here for you. And then lastly, the, the page on the HACCP plans. If you're in the process of developing a plan and you want to take a look at what other people have done, you can go to this page and click on any of the green states, which are states that have contributed plans. Um, in this case, let's just say we click on New York. Um, at the time that I did this, our plan was the only one, I think it may still be, the only one from New York that's been submitted. Um, it's purely voluntary. It's just uh, for information purposes, but you'll see our plan here. It's available as a PDF, and you can download that. Um, read through it and, you know, use it to help you develop your own plan. If you go to another state like Texas, which has a lot of them uh, submitted, you'll see that there's a, a number of national fish hatcheries here. Uh, the University of Texas at Arlington submitted a plan and just a, a wide variety of plan types that are out there. But if, for example, you're raising largemouth bass and you want to look at another somebody else that did a similar plan, you can go here and you can download that and uh, use it as a template. So with that, I'll just kind of wrap it up. Um, here's my contact information and the link to the HACCP website once again. Um, we're trying, again, I think uh, Leslie mentioned early on that we try to do about two workshops a year. We're still trying to do that. Uh, I don't have exact dates set yet for this year, but we are working. I uh, have a couple of ideas going right now. And uh, I'm always available for technical support. If somebody has a plan that they would like me to review or if they have a question about it, I'd be happy to uh, help you with that. And um, 